We arrive at our 25th class session and the last week of instruction for the semester. We continue our study of the affirmative defenses. We began with self-defense. We discussed defense of others and defense of property. There are others which we simply do not have time to cover, such as public duty, law enforcement, or in loco parentis, a.k.a. corporal punishment. We pass over these in silence in order to make space to discuss choice of evils, also known as necessity. It comes into play only when none of the more specific defenses, like self-defense, is applicable. It was considered and rejected in the Regina versus Dudley and Stephen case, which we discussed to begin our semester. The defense of necessity was resurrected in the proposed model penal code. Justification generally, choice of evils. Conduct which the actor believes to be necessary to avoid a harm or evil to himself or to another is justifiable, provided that the harm or evil sought to be avoided by such conduct is greater than that sought to be prevented by the law. The key idea is that abiding by the law in some circumstances means allowing harms that are greater than whatever harm or evil obeying the law would prevent. Since one of the fundamental purposes of the criminal law is to prevent harms, it seems logical not to deter those whose violation of the law avoids worse harms. So it was argued by Professor Herbert Wexler of the Columbia Law School, who was the chief architect of the model penal code. The defense calls for a balancing of two factors. One, the harm or evil sought to be avoided by the actor against the harm or evil sought to be prevented by the law. In short, if the actor broke the law to avoid a worse result, then she should have a defense. The intention is not to provide a backstop to more specific defenses, such as self-defense, where the defendant fails to meet one of the conditions of the defense of self-defense, she cannot appeal to the choice of evil's defense as a fallback. The intention, rather, was to address uncommon situations such as these. Suppose a wildfire will destroy a town unless a firebreak is created by burning a house that is situated in a narrow canyon. The occupant of the house is absent. A neighbor takes it upon himself to burn the house to stop the spread of wildfire. The act is punishable as arson. The choice of evil's defense is meant to be available to the actor. Another example. An ambulance carries a patient who is bleeding profusely. Saving seconds is a matter of life or death. The ambulance driver ignores a stop's light. This is a serious traffic offense but under the model penal code, the driver may raise the choice of evils defense. Or suppose mountaineers are caught in a sudden blizzard. They will perish unless they shelter in an unoccupied cabin. Under the model penal code, they may raise a defense of necessity to charges of trespass, theft, and damage to property. The defense, of course, leaves the owner free to pursue civil remedies. Acquittal of criminal charges in these cases seems sensible. We can hope that the prosecutors would use their discretion and not bring charges in the first instance, but we want a surer guarantee of liberty than that. Apart from similar examples, how widely available is this defense? For example, may animal rights activists who free laboratory animals from captivity avail themselves of the choice of evil's defense? They sincerely believe it is better that premises be entered that animals be tortured and sacrificed. Or consider, what about Extinction Rebellion activists who engage in civil disobedience? They sincerely believe that it is worse that commuters be allowed to spew carbon in peace than for their daily routine to be interrupted to draw attention to an existential crisis before it is too late. Another example, what about damaging Hummers and other SUVs to slow climate change? These activists go closer to the source. They sincerely believe that it is better for SUVs to be rendered unsellable than for them to be used to contribute to heating the earth. 
The commentary to the relevant section, however, suggests that the drafters would not necessarily approve. The balancing of evils is not committed to the private judgment of the actor. The text of section 3.02, however, states, if the actor believes. The commentary indicates that it doesn't, in the end, matter what the actor believes. Well, if you are confused, you are not alone. Not the actor's private judgment. Is the balancing committed to someone else's private judgment? The judges? The prosecutors? Whose? All judgment, in the end, is private, unless there is a public judgment. If the public judgment is what the defense is committed to, where is that judgment to be found? The comment offers this by way of explanation. What is involved may be, may be described as an interpretation of the law of the offense in that the special situation calls for an exception to the criminal prohibition that the legislature could not reasonably have intended to exclude. So it's the public judgment of the legislature that we're after. When the defendant tries to raise the defense, it is the court's task to determine whether the legislature intended to exclude an exception for conduct that otherwise falls under the statute, or seems to. Did the legislature, for example, intend the arson statute to apply when only a fire break will save a town, or the traffic code to apply to ambulances, or the trespass statute to apply to mountaineers lost in a blizzard, or the property damage statute to apply to climate activists? What puzzles me about this comment is that it seems to make the affirmative defense superfluous. All it leads is a straightforward defense to the prosecution's case in chief. Namely, there's no law against doing what the defendant did. My confusion gets worse. The very same comment also says, the code does not resolve the question how far the balancing of value should be determined by the court as a matter of law or submitted to the jury. So, well, I'm stumped. It appears that by default, the balancing of evils is committed to the judgment of some person and that person is the judge. The judge will decide whether or not the jury will hear a choice of evils defense or not. And this assumes that the legislature has adopted this provision of the model penal code. Traditionally, an affirmative defense of necessity has been disfavored. Next time, we will see why.